That's better. My name is Ken Gideon, and I'm the alumni manager here at KUT. And on behalf of the entire alumni development office team and all of the alumni here today, I'd like to welcome you guys to the inaugural KUT Alumni Authors Showcase. This has been a, um, a project in the works for probably about a year. We've been talking about it for quite some time, and um, it's, it's been really exciting to see that when we put a call out to our alumni to say, hey, how many of you are authors? We'd love to be able to feature you on our website. Within a week, we had over 80 alumni say, hey, I'd love to have my, my work, be it academic, be it um, fiction, nonfiction alike, come forward and say, hey, we, we'd really like to be featured on your website. So if you guys haven't been to the alumni website, it's a great reason to do so. It's not just stopping here. If you're an author yourself, again, be it academic, fiction, nonfiction, if you'd like your work published or featured on the alumni website so that anyone can go to your particular website, et cetera, please make sure that you come to the QUT alumni website. We're really excited today to be featuring 16 authors that are here around the room on both sides. If you haven't made it to both sides, make sure that you have an opportunity to do so here today. In addition to the um, authors, many of whom are participating um, in the sessions today, we've got three sessions. The first one today, how many of you have heard of our uh, keynote speaker today, Ben Law? How many of you have heard of Ben? Yeah, that's fantastic. Everybody knows Ben, right? Um, Ben's, a, Ben's a great alumnus of the university. Ben, how many degrees do you have from here? Uh, I don't know. Three. Three? <laughs> three degrees? Um, many of you have either read his book or actually seen the book that's been written into a series on SBS, so we're really excited and pleased that he could join us here today. And then we have two concurrent sessions going on afterwards. Now, because this is the first time we've ever tried to do anything like this here at QUT, we were absolutely overwhelmed. Within 48 hours of opening the event, it sold out. 48 hours. We've never had anything um, like this, and for it to sell out that quick, really, really excited. That's why we can definitely say this is the inaugural event. You'll see it again next year. Part of the reason we're holding it in the library, I know I saw a lot of alumni here today, particularly the authors that hadn't been in this building in quite some time. The library's been recently renovated. Really proud of what's happened here, and, and the director of our library services will be up here in just a moment. Um, but that's part of why we thought it was an amazing location for the very first collaboration of this type to have it in the newly renovated library. So a couple of things just to keep in mind. Um, how many of you are on social media, Instagram and Twitter? So remember, on the very back, you'll see um, you can tweet. You can follow us all day on Instagram. There's been lots of conversations going on. QUT alum showcase. So make sure, oh, alum authors, sorry, <laughs> alum authors. Thank you, Shannon and <laughs> Colleen in the back, making sure I get that correct. So make sure that you join us in that conversation today on social media. Um, what else do I need to say before we... Um, so this particular session is also going to be live streamed into the other half of the room. Everything today will be happening here. So the main session here, the second part of the day, just make sure you look for which room will be hosting which. It's just on the other side, exact uh, similar layout over there. Um, and then we'll be finishing about 1 o'clock today. Keep in mind, at the very back of the room, we have coffee, tea. Um, we have fruit, danishes that will be replenished throughout the day. So without further ado, before we get to our first session, um, I'd like to introduce our host of the day, um, Sue Hutley, who's the director of QUT Library Services. Sue. Ken, and an absolute pleasure to welcome you all today. I have turned the microphone on, and <laughs> so the, the lovely gentleman at the back hopefully will also turn the microphone on. So I think he's turned it on. Again, welcome everyone. <laughs> so I would also like to take the opportunity this morning to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we meet today. Um, QT has always been a place of, of gathering, of learning together, and also of sharing stories. And so, in terms of our traditional owners, acknowledging our elders, past, present, and emerging, and thinking about the stories that they have told, and that we are just about to hear today. So, as Ken mentioned, the library. Now, each of you, as QT alumni will have a library memory. So they could be a little bit different though now, as you can see, than the library that you used to know. So I hope today that you take an opportunity to go through our renovated floors, especially levels five and six. They're completely different 
and new spaces. The library is a place still, the hub of the campus. Um, and it's a pleasure today to have so many of you back with us. Today also, I'm extremely pleased to, I guess, officially announce it, the first alumni event that we've had since uh, changing the way that we allow you access to the library. So there used to be a small charge for QT alumni to access the library and the databases. And I am extremely pleased today to say that that is now completely free. Wow. So for... <laughs> So we hope that you reconnect with the library, uh, mostly online. We're an e-library first off, um, but we do hope that you'll also join us at the library um, in the future as well. I'd like to take this opportunity though to also thank all the staff who have organised today, especially all the staff in the alumni office, um, especially the library staff as well. I do hope that you enjoy today. Please feel free to uh, share with me your library stories, um, anything else I can help you with the QUT library. Enjoy today and I'm really looking forward to hearing all of our fantastic alumni authors. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, one last thing I do want to mention is, when, speaking of online and social media, et cetera, um, everything today is actually being bro um, broadcast or streamed live online. Um, so again, technology, making sure that those that couldn't be here, we had a significant wait list as well. So those that actually weren't able to make it here today, um, they can actually watch it online. And it's, um, they've got links. And so there's a lot of them online doing that now. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce very quickly um, Dr. Donna Hancox, who's going to introduce our first session. So, Donna. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning and welcome again. My name is Donna Hancox. I'm the Director of Research Quality for the Creative Industries Faculty. And it's a delight for me today to introduce Ben Law as the keynote speaker. I know Ben's going to talk about his career during his presentation. There's just a couple of things I'd like to mention because I suspect that Ben's probably too humble to mention some of these things. Um, as all of you would know, Ben is the author of two books and The Family Law is in its fourth reprint and it's also been translated into French. Geisha has been published in India and North America, just two very small markets as well as Australia. <laughs> And he's also co-authored a book with his sister, Michelle. And The Family Law is a really successful and fantastic television series as well as a book, and it's just being commissioned for a second season on SBS. So obviously Ben has enormous talent, and I also know he has a ferocious work ethic as well. And if you've read any of his work in The Good Weekend or The Monthly, or you've seen him speak at any number of events that he's spoken at, you also know that Ben possesses that very rare ability to really confront some societal norms, particularly around homophobia and racism and sexism. And he does so with real humour and real grace, which is very, very rare. And aside from all of these attributes, I guess I just want to talk very quickly about when I think about Ben, I think of his generosity of spirit. And Ben was a tutor of mine quite a few years ago. He was about five years old, I think, at the time. Um, <laughs> And I had come back to study after about a decade away from higher education, which is really daunting. And Ben was teaching a unit called Creative Nonfiction, um, which makes a lot of sense now. Um, and most of you would know that to write and to share your writing, and particularly when you're writing around about real life, it's frightening and it's very easy to become discouraged. And Ben was just so helpful and supportive and enthusiastic in that unit. And he shared his knowledge with us and he made us all better writers. But he also, and I remember this really clearly, he made us better observers and better participants in the world. And that generosity of spirit has continued throughout Ben's career. He mentors um, emerging writers. He has agreed to do more guest lectures in the creative writing discipline than I can even recall. He volunteers with marginalised young people at the Sydney, Sydney Story Factory, which is an amazing enterprise. 
and he's a tireless fundraiser for the, belief, for the causes that he believes in. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce Ben Moore. Oh. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Donna. Um, and thank you all for coming. I, I am blushing in places rarely exposed to daylight. So <laughs> um, I'm really, really stoked to be here. Um, I am QUT alumni. I was here for many, many years. Um, seven plus, in fact. They just couldn't get rid of me. Um, and I'm really, really honoured to be sharing um, this stage with a lot of other alumni who have gone on to their own successes with publishing. I think it's uh, a testament to the strength and the robustness of this university that it's produced uh, so many students who have gone on to produce their own work because it's not easy. It's uh, tough to get your own work out there and um, I think QUT has given us a lot of the skills and capacity and a lot of the mentorship to go on and do such a thing. Um, I, I studied here back when creative writing was uh, very young. It was, uh, it was three years old, so I was the third cohort into a degree from which literally no one had graduated. So when you talk about doing a degree with no career prospects, <laughs> we were literally doing a degree with no career prospects. And um, we used to joke at the time, you know, there were all those great ads like QUT University for the real world. And we'd watch them as undergrads thinking, wouldn't it be great if like we're up there one day? And it, we would always joke that if we had an ad done of any of us because we were writers, it would be us in a cardboard box. Um, and we would jokingly refer to the degree as creative shiting <laughs> instead of creative writing. Um, but it's been really gratifying to, for me to see so many published books come out of not even just the creative writing faculty, but from many, many others as well. Um, it shows the kind of creative spirit that's part of this university as well. Um, we've had a lot of books published. We've had one Miles Franklin shortlisted writer from it as well. Um, and you've had me. So <laughs> no. um, some of you would have uh, either read or maybe seen parts of The Family Law. Um, on TV or as a book. Um, so you will know a bit about my story already, perhaps. But for those of you who don't, and even though for those of you who do, I thought I'd go into a little bit of um, the backstory of the real laws, the actual laws, um, and what they were like. Because even though my story ostensibly begins in the 80s on the Sunshine Coast, um, it really begins further back. That's something that we touch on in the show. It's something I write about in the book. Um, but it goes back to the 1970s, let's start there, where my parents are getting married in Hong Kong. So this is real Jenny uh, and real Danny on their wedding day. Um, real Jenny has only known real Danny for several months, but she's fallen madly in love. Um, Danny has been to Australia once before. Jenny has never visited this country before. And very soon after this photo is taken, they will move to this country. I like this photo for a lot of reasons. They're much younger than I am now in this photo, which I think is quite extraordinary to think about. Um, they're very obje ob objectively attractive, I think I can say, uh, even though I'm biased. What I also like about this photo is they, they still like each other. Uh, <laughs> they have no idea what's coming up. Um, and when I grew up with the story of my parents meeting and them coming to this country, I kind of took it for granted. I didn't think it was that particularly extraordinary or interesting. Um, but then when you become an adult and you look back on your life, which is something that you really do have to do, especially when you're writing a memoir, uh, is you kind of discover the extraordinary dimensions in all of that. So you know, keep in mind that my mum had never visited this country before. She's taking a gamble on a guy that she barely even knows, really, relatively in the grand scheme of things. Um, and they're going to build a new life. Uh, in a new culture, she's leaving behind everyone she knows and she'll have five children um, in this country. Um, when I was writing The Family Law as well, even though I thought this was very much specifically my family story, I kind of realised um, it's the story, it's a very typically Australian story in a way. So when you look at the stats of who we are as a nation, and maybe I'll even just do a pop quiz now, um, how many of you in this room can speak a language outside of English or speak a language outside of English in home? Well, that's quite a bit of you, actually. So you are a part of the one in five Australians who speak a language outside of English at home. Put your hand up if you were born in another country. Again, quite a lot of you. QT is overrepresenting in a really good way. Um, 
That's great. Uh, you are one of uh, the quarter of Australians who were born overseas. And put your hand up if you have at least one parent who was born overseas. Yeah. So that, that, that's, that's kind of keeping with statistics, at least visually. I wasn't counting you all. But um, no, nearly 50% of us have at least one parent born overseas. We're one of the most multicultural nations on this planet. That's not also always represented in our stories, but we are an incredibly diverse people. And for those of you who didn't put up your hand, don't worry, you're very special as well. Um, <laughs> but for those of you who didn't put up your hand, you wouldn't have to go that far back in your family tree, I imagine, to know where exactly your family comes from. Because in some ways, we're one of the oldest nations in the planet because we've got the oldest living cultures in the world right here. And in some ways, we're incredibly young in terms of this idea of modern Australia as well because we come from so many different places um, only in the last couple of hundred of years. So that's my family story. Um, after this photo was taken, this photo was taken, like the day after, basically. Um, and my, my parents did what um, migrants in this country do so well, which is they bred prolifically. They had five children. Um, they weren't religious. They were just enthusiastic. Uh, and uh, from left to right, we've got my brother, Andrew, there's Tammy, there's Candy, there's me in the visor, and that, um, I don't know if you guys remember the 1990s version of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but you remember the Krang, the sentient brain? I kind of think that my sister looks like Krang in this photo. Um, that's Michelle, and that was taken in the 1990s, as you might have been able to guess, at the Sunshine Coast um, Fair. Um, and, you know, even now, when I go back to the Sunshine Coast where I grew up, it's, it's quite a monoculture as well. Like, we really stood out. It's getting more diverse nowadays, but I was one of three Asian kids in my year level at school as well. So we really stood out for a lot of reasons. One, obviously, our race. Um, the other thing that was happening as well is that my parents split up when I was 12 years old. And so at school, <laughs> this is just disastrous, but at school we had this thing called a buzz book, which was a, an address book of all the families at school. Um, the kids' names and their year levels, their phone numbers, so you could reach out to each other. And it was always really public whose parents had split up over the years. So we became one of those families when I turned 12. And so growing up as um, a kind of a minority uh, gave me an outsider's perspective, which I think you can resent when you're growing up, but comes in handy if you want to be a writer, to be able to see the world from a different perspective, to be able to see things that not everyone necessarily does. Um, and I guess the other thing that was happening around this time was I was realizing I was another minority in some ways, which you might be able to tell from this photo, that's right, I was gay. So, uh, <laughs> um, so I'm this minority within a minority within a minority. I am a minority to duckin. And, um, and again, this is something that I wrestled with growing up. Keep in mind that in this state of Queensland, we didn't decriminalize homosexuality until the 1990s. Um, so it, not, it wasn't just the worst thing socially that you could be in the schoolyard, but within my lifetime, it was a criminal offense to be who I, who I am and who I was as well. But with all of that, like I say, it does give you an outsider's perspective that becomes quite handy. And so from those kind of stories, the stories of myself, and of course, the secret about writing about yourself is you can't write about yourself without writing about the people in your life, unless you are a hermit that's lived in the caves for the past 20 years. Um, and what I realized when I became an adult is, um, you know, this story that I had of growing up gay and Asian in a very white part of Australia in the 1990s and the 1980s, so multiculturalism to Hansenism, um, while my parents' marriage combusted around me, you know, it's not exactly the classic Australian story, but I realized it was kind of an interesting one. It wasn't typical as well. Um, I started writing. I started writing uh, first for the student magazine here, which was called Utopia back then. I started writing for um, the Korea Mail, um, but it was really when I started writing for two publications, Voice Works, which, was a, which is a youth national publication, and also Frankie Magazine, that I realized people might be interested in in your own story, actually. They encouraged us to write about ourselves. And so after I, um, I was studying concurrently, and after I finished studying here and doing my doctorate, I started writing a book. And that book was about my family, 
uh, our last name is Law, and it was called the Family Law. It's a very clever play on words. I'm not sure if you understand it. Um, <laughs> this, was, this was the first cover of the book that's supposed to represent me at the age of um, 12, when my parents are splitting apart, obviously not very happy being a part of that family, with uh, all of their identities blacked out, um, even though I totally use their real names in the book. Um, <laughs> after that, that print run, uh, we went to this cover. Um, so we've, that's supposed to be a Chinese firecracker, but a lot of people couldn't tell the script on the side was Chinese. They just saw explosives. So we've gone from a book um, that ostensibly kind of looks like an abuse memoir to a terrorism memoir. Um, for the French version of that book, there is no family. So now it's like an orphan memoir. Um, <laughs> Then we just got to this strange big-headed uh, version of the book, so it's a medical condition where I retain water in my skull memoir. And then, of course, the final edition of the book, which is the current one, has a family back on the cover. And that isn't my family, but the actors who play um, the Law family on the SBS TV series um, that was based on the book. Um, for those of you who haven't seen the TV show, I'm just going to show you um, the trailer from it. Let's see. There we go. No birth is easy. Everyone thinks baby number three will be quick because the lady is already stretched out. This is my mother. For as long as I remember, she has been... Step, step, step right into mommy's vivi. Inappropriate. Ben! Ow! I've got an audition! Well, I've always liked making people happy. It's true. Every time he gets on stage, people can't stop laughing. Is everything okay with you and mom? Just give them space. You wouldn't know what it's like to slay your guts up for this family. Oh, 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 what the hell's a dead bitch? Why can't you just forgive dad? You're a good boy. Dad, come on, I don't just wake up like this. Thank goodness someone took the initiative to seek outside help for this family. Thank you. My name is Benjamin Law, and this is my family. <laughs> so after the book came out, oh, thank you, thank you. So after the book um, came out, um, Matchbox Pictures, uh, who uh, the biggest production company in Australia at the moment. They make um, shows like Barracuda on the ABC, um, they made The Slap, they made Glitch, um, they've made Nowhere Boys, if you guys have young people in your house, it's a really great show. They, almost, they also make The Real Housewives of Melbourne, uh, which is a very, very good show as well, <laughs> that I like very, very much. Um, they bought the rights to the book and we spent several years turning it into a TV show. The book has no narrative structure whatsoever, it's a collection of stories, so we decided we had to choose uh, what the narrative arc would be. We decided to set it around one summer. We set it during puberty because that's just the most painful, hilariously awful time in any person's life. Um, and we set it over a summer where the parents' marriage was imploding and the question was, would they be able to fix it? Um, and the process of the show was really, really fantastic. Um, we filmed it uh, here in Brisbane, um, mainly in Sunnybank, uh, for several months as well. Uh, that in itself is quite rare to get a TV show with a national audience that's produced in Queensland, so we're really, really happy about that. One of the other things we were really quite happy with as well is that um, the cast was 90% Asian Australian. Right now in Australia, one in 10 Australians have significant Asian heritage, and that's something I think we can all safely agree that isn't represented on our screens robustly. So this was kind of a corrective to just swamp, for want of a better word, uh, the production with Asian Australian talent. And what's interesting is when we were casting, it was one of the most difficult casting processes that the casting directors and the uh, producers and director have ever had. Because even when we were writing the show, we were thinking who would actually play these parts, and because there are so few prominent Asian Australian actors, we didn't actually have those names on our fingertips. So we cast um, in three different continents. Uh, we reached out to schools and sports groups and community centres that wouldn't necessarily always have actors as well. In the end, though, I think it's quite interesting that we found 
uh, actors who all had extensive experience, just not in front of the screen. Um, Fiona Choi, who plays Jenny, um, is based in America because there simply isn't enough work for her here. Also, she has family there. But An Anthony Brandon Wong, who plays Danny, the dad, he's based in America for half a year because similarly there isn't enough work in Australia. Um, they've both been in huge productions. Anthony was one of the actors in The Matrix. Fiona Choi has been in HBO and Showtime productions. So they've had small roles in big productions. And we were really proud of the fact that they got to have, finally, a big role in a smaller production. Um, I'm going to throw it over to Donna soon. We'll have a conversation on stage, and then I'd be happy to take your questions as well. But recently, um, at another event, I was asked why I write. And uh, it was kind of like my brain left my body thinking about that, because I haven't really questioned that for a really long time. Why do I write? Because in so many ways, it's, it's my job. It's kind of the way I communicate naturally as well. But when I look at all my work, whether it's um, uh, screenplays or columns or um, the books that I write, I do realize that uh, there is kind of a thread. I'm interested in stories that aren't rarely heard about or spoken about um, that are rarely broadcast as well. And a lot of people recognize that a lot of the work I write about comes from a minority perspective. But I can't, I can't write from any other perspective in a way. And I'm most interested in those stories. And this quote um, by Juno Diaz, the Pulitzer Prize winning writer who wrote The Brief and Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde, really resonates with me. And I'm totally going to steal it for this presentation. But he has this great quote where he says, there's this idea that um, monsters, vampires, don't have reflections in a mirror. And what I've always thought isn't that monsters don't have reflections in a mirror. It's that if you want to make a human being into a monster, you deny them at the cultural level any reflection of themselves. Growing up, I feel, felt like a monster in some ways, and I didn't see myself reflected at all. And you know, don't get me wrong, growing up in this country, I feel very, very privileged in so many ways. But one of the major disconnects was never seeing people like myself or my family on screen or in the stories that I read. So I feel quite privileged that I'm working with a team bringing one story, hopefully one of many, many more stories to life. And um, I get the sense that's what a lot of the authors here today are doing as well. Um, so thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'm going to chat with Donna now, mainly about the Real Housewives franchise. Uh, and uh, we'll be happy to take your questions as well. Please welcome back Donna Hancocks to the stage. <laughs> oh, hello again. Hi, <laughs> hi. Thanks, Ben. That was great. And he wasn't joking about the Real Housewives thing. We've got <laughs> Ben's quite a novice in the whole franchise. I am actually across the entire so franchise. So one of the producers so who worked on The Family Law worked on season one of Real Housewives of Melbourne. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to be a snob. I'm going to watch it. And then I totally got sucked in. It's terrible. Yeah, anyway. But we can talk about that. That's not what time. you're here for. No. Um, I, We'll have a bit of a chat, and then we'll throw it open to the audience, obviously, because I imagine there's a lot of questions uh, for Ben. But one of the things I'd like to, you to talk a little bit more about, mm. and we discussed it earlier um, this morning, is that process of moving from someone who was very much a solo writer yep. you know, for you know, various um, publications and across a range of forms, which is you know, each has its own demands on you, but still it's the act of writing and alone and with a editor. Um, but moving from that to that, and, you know, it couldn't be more different, mm. the collaborative environment of television and writers' rooms. And first of all, what was that process like for you making that leap? And what were, you know, for you, did you find that a rewarding experience mm. or it was a difficult experience even though the product was rewarding? So. Um for my postgrad, I really concentrated on TV script writing because I thought that would be a really great thing to get into. Um, and I came out of it almost feeling dumber, actually, because it's a whole new world. It exercises different writing muscles, even though it's still writing as well. And after I left it, I'd assumed that I would very happily be um, a features writer for magazines uh, for the rest of my working life. So I was mainly writing for Q Weekend, which comes mm. out with the Curry Mail. Um, and then I went on to write for Good Weekend, uh, which comes out with the Sydney Morning Herald, which I still write for. And um, I was quite happy about that. But when the, the rights were sold, they, said, they asked, do you, do you have any screenwriting experience? And I thought, well, I do, but I'm not really sure 
that I can like in a, in a in a room full of veteran writers, it's quite intimidating. This is what they've been doing for their entire lives. And though I love watching television, I didn't necessarily feel I had a completely robust uh, literacy in mm. how to work in the writers' room and how to do all that. And one of the biggest challenges was, like you were saying, I have written in a solitary environment for um, for all of my work. So whether it's um, the books that I write or the columns, um, even even journalism, even though it requires obviously research and interacting interacting with people, that's that's harvesting a lot of information that you then bring back and you work by yourself and you think and you analyse, and it's quiet. I mean, I know that a lot of people um, talk as they work or they're reading out dialogue, but I wasn't ever that person. Not sure it's the most, um, it's the recipe for the most robust mental health being a writer and just being by yourself and doing all this. Maybe the writers here can agree with me. Um, but what I found with television was that it was a huge adjustment to become vocal because the way that it works is you gather in a writer's room, the producers, the writers, maybe some people thrown in um, who can throw in ideas as well are there, the note takers there, and there's just a big whiteboard. And your role is to fill that with ideas across the episodes or for brainstorming sessions. Um, and I felt mute for the first few. But then what, what I realized is, and the great joy of television writing is that on the best days, and that's not always, okay. because there are days where it does not work, but on the best days, it's like a really good dinner party with really smart people, and you are trying to solve something together. It's almost like a parlor game. Um, and that's when it gets really fun. And then from there, they give it to you, and then all the individual writers, or the co-writers work on the reps. Mm. And what's that, I guess, what's that feeling like for you of taking a work that, that's really personal yep. and that you wrote alone, and then giving that to a room of people to discuss and dissect and to talk about which bits are working and talk about your family mm. and your characters in that way of how do we make this into something? How does that sort of feel for you? Is, is there an ego or an ownership around the work that you have to let go of in that process? Yeah, I mean, there's an ego. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but I think one of the really helpful things was the person who bought the rights is the executive producer of the show, and his name's Tony Ayres. Mm. And Tony Ayres is one of the finest filmmakers this country has ever seen. Um, he's the executive producer of a lot of shows yeah. that we watch, like The Slap and Nowhere Boys. Um, but he's also been a film director and writer in his own right. And one of his films was The Home Song Stories, which uh, stars Joan Chan and is one of, and is, is autobiographical. It's about his mother's move from China, taking him and his sister to Australia mm -hmm. and what that life was like. And it was tumultuous and it was sometimes tough to watch. And I remember seeing it at the Brisbane Film, Film Festival with um, my siblings. And when the lights came on, we were just in tears. And um, it's beautiful. So when he approached me and said, I, want, I, I think we could make this into a TV show, I was already going to say yes to whatever he was going to offer. I, the only reason I agreed to go out to dinner was I wanted the meal. Like, I was going to say yes to whatever he had to propose. And because um, I've, I'd read a lot of his essays, because he writes as well, I, I'd known his work. I'm a, I was almost a creepy fan. I already knew that he understood the book inside out. By the time we went to dinner, him and his partner, me and my partner, we were laughing at the same... We had exactly the same not-quite-right sense of humour. <laughs> which is then invested into the show for anyone who's, who's watched it as well. So there's a huge... Um, look, I know a lot of TV writers have worked in writers' rooms where it's quite awful, mm -hmm. and that's because not everyone's working on the same show up here. Yeah. Everyone's got a slightly different vision of it. But from day one, Tony curated the writers' room and everyone had the same idea of the show in their head. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And just talking a little bit about the show, that. I'd, I'd read the book when it first came mm. out, and and it was and, you know it's fantastic. And then when I watched the television show, I had the book because it's those vignettes. Mm. It's sort of there'll be one part that is you know deeply moving, and the next one will be you know really funny and you know really inappropriate. Mm. And so you kind of get taken in and out of these yep. really you know deep kinds of emotions in there. And, but I guess I wasn't prepared when I saw the show by how, you know, I cried a yeah. lot and just how really moving it is. And I wonder how you, you know, you've done the book, but then I guess for the fa your family as well, to see themselves represented yeah. on television is an entirely different ball game. How did you negotiate some of those relationships 
I mean, and, it's and really tr yeah. it's really tricky. I mean, my sister Michelle is also a writer, so she was in she was a part of the development of the show very early on, and that was great to have her input um, and her kind of reflections on family as well. Um, so the family was involved in some way, shape, or form, even in the early parts. But it is kind of psychopathic to write about your family right first as a book and it's like let's turn you into a tv show as well and um there is that old i think it's a polish saying i forget who said it but when a writer is born a family dies um and i very much feel that because how do you claim authorship of the account of your family i think it's a pretty egotistical thing to do and it can be a violating thing for, for many people as well um, but even when I was writing the book, it was important for me to for, for, for me to know that they'd read the manuscript and were okay with it. If they had any feedback, I wanted to take it on board. Most of their feedback in the early days was about spelling and grammar, which shows you where their priorities lie. <laughs> and certainly, I think TV is a much more different prospect because not everyone's a, a reader. You know, mm. not everyone reads yep. and probably for, for leisure, but not everyone's a voracious reader. So when you release a book, there'll be some members of the family that are like, well, that's like a lot of people I know won't necessarily read that, so that's fine. <laughs> but television's really public and there are ads for it and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it's on SPS, it's not that public, but you know, <laughs> but, um, but it becomes a little bit exposing. Mm. And uh, I think the idea of a TV show coming out was there for a long time, but Luckily, development for television takes a really long time. It took about three or four years to even get this greenlit um, because it just took that long. Uh, and I think there was a kind of a low hum of anxiety about what this would even mean until I showed them the first script for yeah. episode one. And then it made them laugh. And as Oscar Wilde says, if you're going to tell the truth, make them laugh, otherwise they'll kill you. Uh, so it made them laugh, and that was... That was the key, and then they were totally on board to the fact that to the to to the extent where um, there was a day where I really wanted to make my to my family to make a cameo on the show, because in the original script there was a judgmental Asian family <laughs> that look at the laws judgmentally, and I thought I know the family who <laughs> can play judgmental Asian family is going to be this real meta moment, um, and the, a version of that is in the show as well. So they came for a full day on set. We all hung out with our younger car counterparts. They had kind of made their own family mm. as well, which was really cute. And we all, we all are still firm friends. So a lot of us see each other on a social basis. Um, we're all friendship, uh, Facebook friends. Uh, one member of my family is dating a cast member. <laughs> Scandal. <laughs> so Not wrong. Not themselves. No, no. I mean, because like, even in the first cast read-through, we were like, oh, you guys are playing family. Wouldn't it be funny if two of the actors dated? Because like that Dexter, it happened in, oh, in yeah, Dexter. Dexter. Um, but no, it kind of crossed over into the real world as well. So let's just say my family has all been pretty happy with it. <laughs> One of them more so. <laughs> yeah. So what's happening with season two? Oh, yeah. yeah. So um, look, we got, we got greenlit for series two as series one was yeah. happening, which is rare. And we're really, really pumped about it. Um, we didn't announce it till later. Um, but we've been developing it. Basically, we haven't had a break from the show uh, this entire time. We've gone from production straight back into development for series two. Um, the series one was very much the arc of a, de uh, of a separation in a way. Uh, will Jenny ultimately leave Danny? Will this marriage be finished? And series two um, really looks at the aftermath I mean, we're writing comedy here. It's pretty funny. Uh, the aftermath of a family imploding yeah. as well. And, and in all of that growing pain. So, so we're really looking at, um, because at the end of series one, they're quite optimistic about the future. And series two is a reality check. OK. Oh, that's a good teaser. Yeah. So I'd like to ask the audience if there's any questions you have for Ben mm. at all. You yes. can ask him. Hello. <laughs> hi, Sue. Not the librarian who works at all, but hi. <laughs> is it on this time? Yeah. I don't know if it's it is, on. It is yeah. on, yes. Um, 
Ben, love to hear your stories about some of the crazy questions that people have asked. Um, <laughs> well, perhaps not too inappropriate, but, you know, what, what, what's it like in that uh, people come up to you and especially with the series being so public now, yep. uh, just wondering if you've got any fun stories about uh, crazy times as an author. Okay, so I was at the Bendigo Writers Festival a couple of weekends back, and there was this guy who came up, and he was a huge fan of the show, which is great, you know. Um, the show did really well for SBS, which is why they commissioned Series 2, so it's been nice. It's, you know, you put a TV show out there, it's not like you've got that immediate feedback except on social media. So this guy was really enthusiastic, and he came up and he said, but why does your mum have, like, such a strong accent in the show? That's, isn't that, like, kind of racist and I was like but my mum has a really strong accent in, in real life and I had to kind of convey to him that that was a really strange take on it so that was odd um, what else I once got on a bus in Brisbane when I was hung over and someone recognized me because I was writing for Q weekend at the time and we had this chat and I felt terrible because I was not at my best and then he got off the bus and he's like well it's nice to meet you you're not as funny in real life. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't know it was a stand-up. Um, what other story? You know, like, look, but to, to be honest, in terms of the public reaction to the show, what's been really gratifying, of course, one of the things that we expected was the Asian-Australian response to the show. Like I said, there's a really, really strong Asian-Australian community in this country. And for a very long time, for as long as I've been in this country, we haven't really seen ourselves on screen except in part roles. So to put them at the centre of a show is rare. And in fact, the only other time it's been done was for this really fun kung fu comedy called Maximum Choppage, which was on ABC2 starring Lawrence Lung, the Melbourne comedian. And that was also made by Matchbox Pictures. And unless production companies make a real effort to say, we're going to make a kung fu comedy with a Chinese family. We're going to make a sitcom with a Chinese Australian family at the centre. We're going to make, as Matchbox Pictures is also doing, the first Muslim rom-com in Australia. It's called Ali's Wedding. It's coming out soon enough. Um, it's not going to get done. So when this actually came out, that response was really great. Like a lot of people, there's a scene in episode one where Benjamin had to get up late to pee and he's having a moment with his dad who's watching late night TBB Hong Kong canto dramas and he just passes a bit of sliced apple into his mouth. It's the smallest moment in the script. It doesn't have that much gravity or it doesn't advance the plot in any way. But so many people said, that right there is my childhood. Like that in those two seconds is my entire Asian Australian childhood. And I didn't realize we were doing anything like that. So that's been gratifying. Um, another thing that I didn't see coming was a lot of um, mixed race Australians have come out and said, oh my God, there are mixed race Aust Asian Australians on screen. And we just thought that it was this funny joke that, you know, a lot of um, people in the Asian community is just like, the mixed race kids are always better looking. So we really wanted that in the show and that the perfect neighbours across the road would be a mixed race family with perfect, perfect, <laughs> genetically perfect children. But um, that became like this huge thing that I didn't anticipate, that I realised a lot of mixed race Australians also don't see themselves mm. on screen. We weren't trying to break new ground or anything like that. Um, but one of the most gratifying things that I also didn't expect was non-Asian Australians saying, wow, that's my family. Um, and I don't know why it should surprise me, and it's almost sad that it does surprise me because I've spent my entire life seeing my family in other representations of families that aren't Asian Australian. I don't think it should be that surprising that white Australians or Greek Australians would see their families in, in this. Um, and Aziz Ansari, who's an American comedian, has a really good point where he says there's this huge reticence in um, production houses and in broadcasters to show diversity on screen because they're afraid that audiences won't relate to the characters because they're not, they're not them. Um, but his point is we can relate to and happily relate to anthropomorphic robots yeah. and talking fish and monsters graduating from university. Like, you know, if we can, why should it be that different to um, recognise ourselves in anyone, uh, really? Thanks for your question. Mm. Any other questions? 
Well, fortunately, I have one. Um, <laughs> Preloaded. <laughs> Well, no, it follows on from that, and I sort of brought it up a little bit in the introduction, but, you know, talking about that push to show more or hear more diverse voices, mm. both in, you know, in literature and also on the screen. And I know that, you know, your, your persona as Ben Law, you know, at live events and across social media, you know, you never shy away from <laughs> making your, you know, your beliefs around social justice, around politics, just about being a generally good human being. Oh, thanks, really, I'm also <laughs> gross on social media I know, well. he actually really is. <laughs> and, your, you know, and your feelings about bodily functions really yeah, clear on you. social media. But I'm just wondering, <laughs> has that, you know, that sometimes is, a, you know, it's a risk, and particularly when part of what you do is about being really likeable and mm. really funny and really relatable, and then making that decision to also say, but I'm not, I'm not going to shy away from the things I yeah. believe in as well, and I'm going to do that publicly, and I'm going to be really clear and straightforward about my beliefs in those areas. Mm. Has that been a risk for you at times, or you just kind of discount any? No, not really. Um, you know, I think my parents raised us with the confidence of, of white people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I think, I mean, that's a very glib response. It's funny, I was having this conversation with my friend who was um, high up in Channel 7, and he was like, it's great that you've got a strong uh, following on social media, but your brand's really, like, muddy. You know, you go from social justice to talking um, about, like, bodily functions or something, or, like, a stupid joke that you've heard, blah, 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 blah. It's not really that consistent. Yeah. And I'm like, but who is yeah. in real life? I mean, I just, I, like, when I hear the idea that people want to encapsulate themselves in a brand and especially writers because you know we're, we're really after interesting stories as well and stories aren't easily crowd into a brand um, you know just I mean it's a personal thing but I'm kind of allergic to it it kind of makes me throw up um, and uh, so so no it's not that difficult because I mean in the early days one of the main reasons I was in social media I really like social media is I don't have colleagues and I was lonely <laughs> uh, it, it simulated conversation that I could have with people um, but you know now yeah sure like I think you reach a threshold of Twitter followers and you're going to get people abusing you, mm. uh, for instance, but the mute function is a beautiful thing on Twitter. And I don't n get nearly as much abuse or horror as any female with anything to say yeah. on social media. So, um, yeah, it, yeah, it doesn't bother me because partly because I don't get nearly as the, vol the volume yeah. or, the, or the intensity that other people get because they're women. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, yes. The obvious question for this particular forum is is there going to be another book? No. Um, look, I've, got, I've, I've been playing with a few ideas um, for the stories that I want to write next, and they could be books. There's a few, when I've been writing television, there are like a lot of ideas for feature articles that I've been wanting to write because I, I, I miss that side of writing a lot. Um, but no, the, the TV show has been a full-time job um, to the extent where we're now submitting revisions for, like major revisions for the script every 72 hours. So um, we are not really having time, time to wipe our butts. And for the, parent, the, for the parents in the production team, I'm just like, I don't even know how you're wiping your children's butt. Um, but uh, no, uh, I've got ideas for what I want to do next. And there are a lot of them, but they're not even embryonic at the moment. They are zygotes and uh, <laughs> they, they need some time to grow. Yeah. But yeah, I, 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 I want to. That's the short answer. We've got time for one more question. There was a question up the back. Yes, there? hello. Yes. My question was related to that. Yes. My question was related to that, but um, you didn't see your future as being a scriptwriter, and now with your experience in the family law, etc., do you see further scripts in the future, perhaps even, um, I guess, looking at your current novels, developing those and, and um, pitching those? Um, look, I really like television writing a lot, more than I ever anticipated that I would. Um, I also really like television at the moment. I think television has gotten really really good um, and uh, I'd love to work in it more and in fact as I've been working on the family law 
some other work that I've been working on con concurrently has been developing other people's ideas for the screen, which, I've re which I realise I really like to do. Mm. Like when, when someone gives you a seed of an idea and you can expand the world and all that sort of stuff. Um, yes, I would love to. No plans at the moment, working on a few other things. This is a very kind of common television project, which is, yeah, we're working on five things at the moment and maybe none of them will ever come up, but it's kind of how television works. Everyone's throwing poo at the wall and seeing what will stick, for want of a better way of putting it. Um, and, I, and I am a part of that, that process. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to write more. But in terms of like based on my own work, uh, you know, we would love to do Family Law Series 3. We're already talking about it. So that kind of feels like I'm still drawing on my own work, for better or for worse. <laughs> yeah. So we're out of time, and I just, yep. I'd just i love to thank Ben. I just need to grab something from behind the screen. Oh, my God. Um, Is it a real housewife? <laughs> I really wish it was, actually. That would be perfect. But that's just to oh. say thank you so much for your time this morning. Thanks, it's been Donna. great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.